that we have a great panel for you today. And I think that um, despite all the classes of cars out there, I think some might say that it all sort of began uh, with hot rods, uh, and particularly hot rods in Southern California. So I think we have an amazing panel today to talk about the history um, of hot rods. And I think um, you got some of the best experts in the world here. So I'm going to introduce the moderator, Ken Gross. If Ken can come up and <laughs> Ken will introduce our distinguished panel of experts. Mm. Please enjoy and uh, be sure to come back. We have forums going on through Saturday as well. Thanks for coming. Ken? Thank you, Ron. Great. So I, I heard him say something about shrunken heads. Good afternoon, everyone. So if you came here for customs, you're in the wrong place. This is, this is, this is going to be about hot rods. I'd like to thank you all for coming and introduce our panel. Uh, let's start with Bruce Meyer, if Bruce would come up. So, you know the old cliche about this is a person who needs no introduction, but uh, I will say about Bruce, besides uh, our being friends for 25 years, he, uh, he's the founding director of the Peterson Automotive Museum. He's in the Bonneville 200 mile an hour club. He owns all the hot rods we wanted as kids. And he's just an all around great guy. So Bruce, thank, thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and next we have Drew Harden. And uh, Drew is wearing his uh, Hot Rod shirt, and he comes by it honestly because he was the editor of Hot Rod magazine. He's currently the editor of Hot Rod Deluxe. Uh, personal shameless plug, my 39 Ford is on the cover this month. And <laughs> Drew is um, he's also the, um, uh, the editor of the, of the Motor Trend uh, uh, Muscle Car magazine as well, and uh, just an all-around great knowledgeable guy. So Drew, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ken. Tom, Tom Taylor and Jim Miller are standing there wondering who's going to be next. And I, let, let's have Tom come up. So, Tom Taylor is um, another person who probably needs no introduction. He has written a bestseller, uh, which is How to Draw Automobiles. He's been on the staff of many of the magazines, and his renderings have been the beginnings of lots of cars that have appeared on the covers of, uh, of all the Hot Rod magazines. <laughs> And, and next and, and uh, last, but by no means least, is Jim Miller. And Jim is with the American Hot Rod Foundation. Um, he, um, he has run over 200 miles an hour at El Mirage. As Bruce just said, that's doing it the hard way. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, his dad was Eddie Miller, whose uh, Pontiac Lakester was here a number of years ago when we had Bonneville cars. It was on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine in the early uh, 50s. And Jim, thank you for coming. Thank you. Now, next is a real technical test. We have Alex Exidius on the phone. Alex, can you hear us? I do, Ken. I hear you very well. Oh, great. OK, terrific. So let me say a couple of things about Alex. Uh, <laughs> Alex and I have been friends for a long time. He's really everyone's friend. Uh, he founded the, um, the SoCal Speed Shop, the original SoCal Speed Shop in 1946, right after he got out of the service. He likes to say that the Germans heard he was coming to Europe and they surrendered in 45. And Alex, um, Alex, I don't even know where to start with Alex. You know, the, uh, the SoCal Speed Shop teams with their livery, their, um, their belly tank, which Bruce owns, their, uh, their SoCal coupe. They were record setters from the beginning. And Alex is the only one of us, although many of us knew Bob Peterson, Alex was there literally when it all started. So um, Alex, if you, uh, you can hear me OK, we'll, uh, we'll start with a comment or two from you. I remember that you said that you uh, didn't want to have an advertisement in the first couple of issues of, of Hot Rod. Would you tell us why? <laughs> I can. I want to tell you, first of all, how delighted I am and how flattered I am that you invited me to join this very, very auspicious panel. Uh, they're all good old friends of mine, and, and I enjoy looking forward to it. And I want to warn them, however, that once in a while I'll probably interrupt their story to tell a better one about the old days. So <laughs> I just want them to know this is going to happen. Anyhow, I, this goes back... I, I knew Pete when he was 20 years old, so he was with a group of uh, Hollywood 
advertising and entertainment group, and they came to the SCTA to see if we could join in together and put on the, the first hot rod show, and uh, which we did. And Pete was selling booths in that show, and and uh, he came into the shop to sell me a booth, and I took a booth, and and glad to have it. And uh, then he came later. This all happened so quickly; it was amazing. He, First he was working for that company, and the next thing I know, he was bringing out Hot Rod Magazine. And uh, he came to the shop to sell me an ad in the first Hot Rod Magazine. And at the time, I was advertising in the SCTA Racing News, and that was pretty, I thought it reached everybody that was in Hot Rodding, which was SoCal, which was Southern Cal in those days. And I told him that, you know, I'd just wait and see how it worked out because I was already reaching my customers. Well, right after he left the shop, I thought to myself, you know, if this magazine makes it, uh, I just screwed myself on ever having a cover for sure. But he he forgave me over the years and did a lot of wonderful things for me. And so, anyhow, opening the shop was was a, a gamble, but it was a fun gamble because I was doing something that I really wanted to do, and I I've been able to do it the rest of my life. I've been in, in hot rodding and and enjoyed. Hundreds and thousands of friends, actually. So that pretty gets that gets me started, Ken. Well, I, I want to ask you one more thing before, uh, and there'll be lots more. But but I think I remember you saying that it didn't make you might get someone from San Diego to uh, to order a manifold, but anywhere else wouldn't work. And then kind of what what's what changed that uh, for you? That uh, people started advertising. I think you said from Chicago and everywhere else. Ordering manifolds well, and ordering you know, stuff. It really isn't a secret what happened. At 21 years old, he brought out Hot Rod Magazine, and it accelerated. Well, it accelerated like a hot rod, actually. First of all, they were counting the subscriptions coming in on the bed in their bedroom in the office and, and giggling and using the money to go to dinner that night. And then pretty soon, my God, it just took off. And, as we all know, it became a huge, huge success, and all of a sudden, uh, people running at El Mirage were taking a second, second step to with the people in Chicago and and Iowa and everywhere else in the country. It just exploded and became an international success, and it enabled our industry a place to advertise to reach more than just around California. It, it, Oh, great. That's, changed everything. That, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, Jim Miller pointed out, I was going to do this, but Jim's done it even better than I have. Uh, Hot Rod was by no means the first of these magazines. And Jim, give us a quick synopsis okay. of what, uh, yeah. what they were. When I go back, there was a magazine called Coast Auto Racing that came out in 1934. It started as a newspaper, then it ended up in Apple 11 like Hot Rod. He had a red masthead and all that stuff. And they covered mostly circle track, but every once in a while they do the dry light stuff, which is the genesis of all the car stuff. And then SCTA Racing News, the first one came out in 1938. And that was a mimeograph thing from one car club. And then Throttle Magazine, which everybody says is, that was the one that really set the standard for hot rod. That was in 41. Then war came, basically shut down everything, and Veda Orr started up the SCTA Racing News in 1944 again, which is a mimeograph, and she got all the servers spent from the SCTA names and started sending those things out. When everybody came back from the war, the SCTA said, well, you're finished, and they restarted the news under their name, but. Beta went and started the CT News, and that started covering circle track and dry lakes and a little bit more expanded, and some out of California. And then Ray Coons, he did this racing magazine, kind of, but in 46, he did the first one covering hot rods, per se, and that had a real wide circulation. And then. Road Track, Speed Age in 47, and then Hot Rod came on the scene in 48. And then it just snowballed, Quinn Publishing with Top Up, and then Chicago, New York, all the places with the small and big magazines. So that's kind of an overview. 
It isn't to say that Pete's idea wasn't a good one, <coughs> but it was the first one that succeeded. And Drew, what do you, what do you think? Why, why did it succeed when it did? A couple things. One, he launched very aggressively. I mean, that, this was a monthly magazine right out of the gate, which surprised a lot of people. They figured, you know, one, maybe two issues. But he was selling subscriptions with the very first issue. And he did have a vision. I think he had the vision of, of reaching enthusiasts all around the country. Um, and he was, he was also helping the aftermarket along. I think there's, there's stories about him talking to Vic Edelbrock Sr. about trying to buy you know, ads in Hot Rod Magazine. And, and Vic Sr. didn't want to because he was too busy with his business. So as I understand the story, Part of what Peterson did was talk Vic Sr. into producing a catalog of parts so that he could then send that catalog out to different parts of the country, which would free him up to still concentrate on his business in California. So my thinking was that Peterson had a lot of you know, forward-thinking ideas like that that helped spread this far beyond just Southern California. He, he told me this story about going to Vic, Vic Edelbrock, who he respected, but also found a somewhat forbidding uh, personality. And after, uh, and Edelbrock said, I don't want to do a catalog. You know, I, who's going to do it? We're, we're busy pumping gas here. We're doing service. And Pete said, I'll take the pictures, and I'll help you write it. And that happened. And people started sending in 25 cents for this catalog. And uh, Peterson asked Edelbrock how that was going. And Edelbrock said something about, you know, we don't have uh, time for, for this thing. It's um, People are calling us. We're still trying to pump gas here. And uh, Vic was determined to kind of keep it small. And like, apparently Pete said to him, you know, maybe you should realize you're a speed merchant now. You're not, you're not just in the gas pump business. But, so in the early days, um, the, the covers were, and I, I guess I'd have Tom talk about this, but I want to ask Bruce a question first. Um, the covers are what you saw first. You know, I know myself, I. Um, Every Tuesday, because that's when all the magazines came out, I went to our little local uh, variety store to see what was on the newsstand. I couldn't afford a, uh, a subscription. And Bruce has several of the cars that were on those early covers. And, uh, and I, I guess I would ask Bruce, what is it about a car on the cover of a magazine that, uh, that's magic for, uh, for everybody? Well, it's all about the history and the story. And having grown up with Hot Rod Magazine, I remember Pete saying he did it in black and white and with a red masthead because he wanted to look like Life Magazine because that was an established magazine. So, so he came out and, and started featuring cars on the cover. Well, I, I, I grew up in the 40s, and I remember waiting for my Hot Rod Magazine to come. And the cars on the cover were the feature cars. And they were the important cars, at least in the day, and important to me. So I started when I, when I got involved with researching the history of hot rodding. I looked at, I, bought, I had a whole series, the whole run of Hot Rod Magazine. Of course, I looked at the cover cars. So um, I, I really treasure the cars that are on the covers. And, you know, that, and obviously, you're, you're, you're featuring them at Pebble Beach, which was Ken's brilliant idea to get the great cover car. So, uh, you know, to me, it's all part of, it just adds to the history, adds to the story, adds to the importance of the car. And, um, you know, it's kind of w what I've done. Uh, the, uh, I'll use that as a quick segue to tell you that we will have eight cover cars uh, on the field on Sunday. We're, um, <clears throat> we're loading them in on Saturday, and we'll have blow-ups of the covers uh, in front of them so that they, people can remember. We've never done that at Pebble, to have uh, blown-up uh, covers or, or illustrations of anything for cars on the field. Uh, and actually, the reason we have hot rods at Pebble Beach is really due to Bruce. And it's a neat story. If most of you don't know, I'll, I'd like to ask Bruce to tell how, sure. how we got, how, how deuces got mixed with Delages, Delahays, and deuces. <laughs> well, it was, it, I would love to say it was an overnight deal, but it was 10 years of begging. We had, we had um, Lauren Tryon and Jules Human that when I first started talking to them, and, and it was in the, in the late 80s, I said, you know, you should, and that's when I kind of got involved in, in the historic hot rods. I said, you should really have a historic hot rod class. And they're looking to me like, 
over our dead body. We will never dumb down our show and bring these hot rod guys here. And it was like, it was like poison to their show. So every single article that had any connection to hot rodding, that had any connection to the legitimacy, that had any connection to anything that they could relate to, I sent them. And I mean, after 10 years of nagging and begging, they, they just, I still have, them, and Ken has the facts. I got a fax from Lauren Trine. He said, okay, Bruce, okay. Are you sitting down? For one year only, I'm gonna just like, I was so annoying, and I can be annoying. I got my wife right there, she knows that. I just wore them down, and, and uh, that was in 90, they, the, the facts came in 96, and we had the first, first um, hot rod class in 97. And they put us so far out in the show field that if we'd have been 10 feet further, we'd be in the bay. <laughs> and it was um, such a treat, because Ken was head judge, and their heroes, and of course our heroes, Dan Gurney, Phil Hill, they were all hanging out with us. The outlaws, right? And I remember one of the uh, magazines said, Outlaws at the Gate, you know? And, and you know, when you think about it, um, and it's been kind of a mission for me personally, and, and Ken shares that, to, to um, share the rich history of hot riding and to expose it and, and to teach people how important it was to our history. I mean, it is an American sport, it's an American phenomenon, and, and it was the start of so many automotive, you know, geniuses. And I, can I tell the story about Phil Hill real quick? Absolutely. So I had the great pleasure of having lunch with Phil Hill every Friday for about 30 years. It was J.B. Nethercutt, Phil Hill, Phil and a, a couple of classic car guys, and, it, and Nethercutt hosted it. <laughs> and Phil, we were talking about and this was probably about in, you know, when they mentioned hot rods at Pebble Beach, and Phil said, you know, and Phil grew up in a very privileged environment, and he was a Renaissance man. I mean, he spoke foreign languages and drank fine wine and played the piano. All the, some of us do that. I don't do that. But um, he was a very, very special guy and grew up in a wonderful environment. But his parents refused to have him hang out with this low life, you know, go nowhere hot rod group. <laughs> And as we all know, every community had their roadster club. And, and it was all about roadsters in the early years. And in Santa Monica, the, the, the car club there were called the Low Flyers. And Phil said, Bruce, do you know who was in the Low, low Flyers? And I said, Phil, I, I don't I have no idea. He said, well, Phil Remington, who is the genius of Shelby and the genius of all American races, maybe one of the great yeah. you know, mechanical minds of of a whole generation. Phil Remington, Travers Coons, Stu Hillborn, mm -hmm. um, Jack Engel. I mean, these were guys in the Low Flyers Club in Santa Monica. So he was going on and just talking about these absolute genius legends, you know. And that's really what hot rodding is all about. You know, they, they learned how to fabricate. They came back from the war. They had all this kind of pent up, you know, desire and knowledge and new technology. So. Anyways, I, I'm just, I get so enthused about hot running and how important it is, so I've kind of made it a mission to, yeah. you know, to let that word out because for a while it was like talking about Hell's Angels or something. <laughs> you know? yeah, he was talking about Phil Remington and, and, you know, when they were having trouble with the GT40, um, he was the one that, you know, they brought in Shelby and he took a look at it and just said, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And he got in there and started doing, he started pounding metal around and changing things around. And Phil was really like the one that kind of dialed it in because it was a mess in the beginning. But he started with, I think, like a 33 Ford Cabriolet. And then he built this other neat little roadster that he'd race on the lake. So, you know, he was a hot rodder first. And that's what kind of moved him into then doing if, the if you bigger ask, stuff. If Dan Gurney and Carol Shelby were here, two great Americans. Yeah. I, I bet anything, if you ask them who the most important person was in their careers, it would be Phil Remington, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. without a doubt. And I just was on a family trip, and I read this book called Go Like Hell. I'd read it some years ago. It was about the Ford Ferrari Wars. And I'd read it once kind of quickly, and I, just, I had a lot of spare time, so I read it again. And I bet... 20 times throughout that book, they talked about hot rodders. 
you know, Hot Rodders building the first Cobra and Dean Moon shop. Hot Rodders are prolific. And, you know, once you kind of think, get that hot rod kind of like sensitivity, you realize they are everywhere. We are everywhere. And how important it is, you know? I mean, it, so, just a postscript we to, to, the, to what. Oh, sorry, Alex, you go ahead. Alex. Well, it, it, I, I don't want to get too far ahead on this. Uh, before we talk about the early cars, uh, especially on Hot Rod and everything, I'd like to talk about, I, I think one of the subject matters today is, is the impact that cover cars had on the industry and on uh, the shops and the, and, and the business itself. And because I experienced that personally, I'd like to just talk briefly about uh, my first cover. Uh, as I said, when I turned Pete down on the ad thing, I didn't think I'd ever be on the cover of Hot Rod. Of course, at that time, in 40, early in 48, uh, I hadn't, I hadn't even been a car to run, but I did feel right. this. Yeah, Alex, can you speak a bit louder for us? Thanks. Yeah, hold on. Is that any better? No, no, we need you to be just a bit louder. I'm sorry, I'll talk as loud as I can. Pick up the phone, Alex. <laughs> uh, anyhow, we built this little belly tank at the shop, and it ran a little V860 that Vic Edelbrock certainly helped me with. He was my mentor and my hero at the time. And we set some records and everything, and so at the end of that year, Pete did put the SoCal belly tank on the cover of Hot Rod. And uh, I was so thrilled, and the shop was so thrilled, and it gave us so much ink that it was incredible, the story inside and everything. And we were just going nuts at the shop, and it, it was just absolutely terrific. And, uh, well, it, it helped make SoCal's Pete Shop. But later on, when we heard we were going to go to Bonneville, thanks to Walt and Pete driving up to Utah and getting permission for us to do that, at the shop, we got so excited that we thought we should do something extra special and different. So we took the, the belly tank body off and built an enclosed car on the belly tank chassis. And it was unique at the time, and nobody else had really done it before. And, and we didn't know how fast we would go, but we were excited about the concept, and we were looking forward to it very much. So, so we went to Bonneville, and, and with the success we had up there, the immediate success of going 193 miles an hour when the record was 160 at the time. We managed to get on Pete's cover again in October with the Streamliner. So this is two different covers in one year. It had never been done before, and I'm not sure how many times it's been done since. But the proudest thing about my first cover was that down in the corner of the cover, it said, Photo by Pete. And that was the first time that Pete had... Uh, that was the last cover that Pete shot, so I always had that as a, as a something I was very proud of and very glad to do. So anyhow, we, we went on for several more uh, covers, and I can talk more about that. Our, our second cover was also the Streamliner. We'd gone 210, but the, the main part of what I'm trying to say here is I have a story about this was the third year of Hot Rod Magazine, and by then we were... Hot Rodders were naturally famous everywhere in the world. So uh, when people would come out from Iowa or Chicago or, or Pennsylvania to see the Hot Rods in California, and, and hopefully because of all my ads and all because of the ink I was getting, they wanted to see SoCal Speed Shop. And when they got off the freeway in Burbank, they thought Lockheed was SoCal Speed Shop. <laughs> that's, how, that's how much ink hot rod provided for our industry and uh you can continue on now gentlemen there's a coop coop cover i can talk about a little later but right now i just wanted to emphasize that the early ink that we got in california for our hot rods really paid dividends for the industry and build it up to what i don't know 50. So we had uh, as bruce mentioned we had hot rods in 1997 and the powers that be were sort of convinced that this was maybe a good thing, but they made, made us wait till 1999 to do it again. At Ford Motor Company, uh, John Kleinert stepped in to sponsor the Dean Bachelor Award for the most significant car, which was uh, really terrific. What Ford also did was they 
they made a, a group of leather jackets, black leather jackets with yellow and red flamed sleeves. On the back it said, hot rods, sizzling at pebble. And one of the people who was a recipient was Jay Human, who with Lauren Tryon, who Bruce mentioned, uh, they were the encyclopedia of where all the great cars were, and so they, they brought cars each year. And Jay was an Hispano Suiza guy, not particularly interested in hot rods at all. And uh, I asked him, uh, where are you gonna put us this year? And he said, oh, way down the end. Uh, again, uh, you're a little like the food court in the department store. Everybody wants to go there, but they're going to have to go through all the, all the departments to, uh, to get to you. And I don't know, something in my imp side got me, and I, I looked at him, and I said, you're wearing this jacket. And he said, yeah, I really like it. And I said, two years ago, you didn't know a hot rod from a hot dog, and look at you now. And, and he said, you know, if we don't understand the impact that hot rodding has had on racing and American culture, then we're in the wrong business here. And so there we have, we've had hot rods nearly every other year for a long time. So I wanted to ask um, Tom, as the artistic guy in this group, um, you've designed a lot of covers and certainly a lot of cars, and I'd like Drew to weigh in on this too, but what makes a great cover? Why, you know, we all, went to the newsstand, this is before most people go to Ford subscriptions, and the cover might have you buy the magazine or might not, but what, what, what are some of the reasons why you'd, you'd buy the magazine when you think about it? You know, cover? I've heard all kinds of stuff over the years, and I'm sure Drew will cut, key in on this too, but, you know, it used to be, they used to say, well, if it's a red or yellow or orange car, that'll help sell, and so they would never put a black car or a dark blue car on the cover, and then one time they'd put a black car on just for the heck of it and it would sell the most. So it's, the bottom line is it's sort of a black art. And what ends up happening is it still holds so much importance that a lot of people that shouldn't be calling the shots on it end up doing it. Like the head of circulation, for instance. Right. Do you want to talk about that? Well, it, it used to be, I joined Peterson in 86 when Mr. Peterson was actually still there. Um, and every once in a while I'd actually get to sit in meetings with him. But when we would plan covers back in the 80s and the 90s, you took what we called cover comps, which were mock-ups, drawn mock-ups. Tom did some of those, other artists did them. And we would have to show them to the director of circulation, the vice president of the company, the group vice president in charge of our group, and all those guys would have to sign off on your, on your comp, on your idea, before you could even move ahead and take a single photograph. So, because like our director of circulation said, this is your single most important marketing tool to most of your enthusiast readers, obviously other, except for the subscribers. And statistically, when you're browsing a newsstand, now this was back in the days when there were actually automotive magazines on a newsstand, you had five to 10 seconds to get someone's attention for them to, to pick up that magazine. And if, if, you, if they didn't in that window of time, they were lost. Now, statistically also, even if they picked up that magazine, you had about a 50-50 chance that they would actually buy it. So what you needed to do was make sure that what you put on the cover was eye-catching, number one, so it would get their attention, but then also compelling cover lines, a compelling car, so that they would want to see what was in the magazine. Um, cover design, has gone through a lot of changes when in the 80s and 90s we had a circulation director named Nigel Heaton and Nigel's big thing was busy is better. The more blurbs the better. We, we talked about throwing our entire table of contents on the cover. Um, these days we are back to busy is better. It's really interesting how if, if you do find covers on, on the newsstand, a lot of words again. So uh, these things do tend to cycle. If any of you know what that cover was, Cadzilla. Cadzilla, yeah. Cadzilla. absolutely. Right. Cadzilla. Billy, now, Billy Gibbons, Cadzilla. The, the cover had some other things going for it. It had ZZ Top name recognition. It, it advertised <laughs> a poster inside. But not only did it sell, it was the single most successful issue of Hot Rod Magazine of all time. The sales that month were over a million copies. So if you think about elements on the cover, I'm going to say something that isn't politically correct, but maybe that's okay, pinups. So in the very beginning, Hot Rod had parts with appeal. They had a very attractive lady holding an intake manifold or, or, or something, 
and uh, they somehow, la these ladies migrated to the covers, then they were gone for a while, then they were back, then American Rotter, if you remember that, tried them. So asking our, our cover experts here, uh, what about pinups? Pat Ganahl was the editor of Hot Rod in 1987 and did the first swimsuit cover. Uh, back then in 1987, the only magazines that did swimsuit issues was Sports Illustrated. And what he wanted to do was spoof the concept. Um, he wanted it to be very kitschy, uh, you know, with like inflatable palm trees as props and things like that. He, he did it for the April issue because he wanted it to be an April Fool's issue. Um, Pat was fired before the you stand sales <laughs> results came out. But that issue lifted newsstand sales by 100,000 copies because of the bathing suit models inside. So then for years, we had to do a, a bathing suit issue. We had to do a couple of bathing suit issues um, until we really kind of wore it into the ground. Um, when, when I took over Hot Rod Deluxe, it was pinup car, pinup car on all, on all the covers. But in 20, late 2015, uh, a corporate edict came down that there were going to be no more models on the cover or inside the magazine because the, the company was starting to get pushback um, from certain retailers, from certain advertising agencies. Uh, the women who were involved in the ad buys were, were not appreciating the objectification of women. And so corporate-wide, didn't matter who you were, no more models on the newsstand. Um, with Hot Rod Deluxe, it actually had no influence on our newsstand sales at all. The issue after the model sold just as well as the issue before. What does this say about America? But, <laughs> but Lowrider magazine yeah. went absolutely in the tank. I mean, their, their newsstand sales dropped by something like 80%. So pinups work depending on the audience, and, and like everything else, you can overdo it. You can oversaturate, and then it becomes not special anymore. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Yeah, the, they were getting pushback from retailers, but they were also getting pushback from Hot Rod staff, actually one person in particular, which was Alana Shear. She and I both started, we were both on staff in 2012, and she used to say things about it and in staff meetings, and... Uh, I always thought that it was sort of because of her kind of grumbling about it over the years, it was the reason. She's, she's been the only female staffer, editor of Hot Rod Magazine. She and I both got canned uh, around the end of 2017. But uh, um, she, so she's been the only one. But she was, it, in staff meetings as a, as a man, it, it made you kind of uncomfortable because you realized, yeah, you know, we've, we've kind of gone past that. And uh, maybe it took the retailers to finally put the nail in the coffin, but it didn't have any effect on Hot Rod. The only thing that would happen was if, if there had been a series of issues that didn't have uh, a woman on the cover uh, and the sales were going down, they'd immediately put a woman on the cover just to see if it would spike. So in a way, it was kind of experimenting just to see, okay, is that going to work? Is that why it isn't working? That type of thing. Jim. Yeah, yeah I was going to say the Dick Flint cover that oh. had the roach coming up with the guy jumping out because there was a girl walking in the sidewalk. That's one of my most favorite covers from the 50s because it, it's got hot rods, it's got guys, and it's got a girl on it. And I think that was the first cover with a girl on it for hot rods. That was the first time they hit half a million circulation, too, yeah. I think. So wow. it, was, it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty cool. cool. And your your dad had his Lakester on the uh, on the cover. Uh, what what did that? I mean, you were probably pretty young when that happened. But what did, what did that mean? That was August fifty, and uh, one yeah, yet. it was Tom Medley came out, and they just rolled the car out on the street and shot it right on the street. <laughs> and in the old days, you know, the guys that photographed the cars were so good. Rickman Medley it goes on and on. They just make it up right there because you didn't have to get a permit to shoot them. You know, there's a lot of stuff. And that was hot running. You just make it up on the spot, and it's like, yeah, good shot. And they had good technical writers and good, yeah. Well, you know, when you think of some of those covers and the efforts it took to do them, um, another uh, very famous cover is the Lloyd Bacon Coupe, 
which uh, was here at Pebble Beach a few years ago. And Eric Rickman shot that cover. It shows two attractively dressed ladies in bathing suits next to the car. He got in the swimming pool to shoot the cover because that was the only way they could get that, that kind of an angle. And he also got up right. on ladders a lot, which is something that uh, I think we do now where you don't have a, a studio. Well, I think actually Rick was in, on a ladder in the pool. In the pool. <laughs> in order to get the angle that uh, he needed to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We don't want to think of what would have happened if he dropped the battery, and uh, no, not, uh, not at all. Yeah. No. <coughs> Truly. I, I, um, I found a, a, a photo of a, a cover setup that Bob DeLevo did back in the early 60s. It was, it was a dragster coming right at the reader, like right off the cover. That's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, these days with GoPros and drones, I mean, something like that's really easy to accomplish. Those days, not so much. He had two ladders on either side of the of the uh, the lane on the drag strip, with a pole, but bridging the gap between the ladders, bags of cement on the poles mm -hmm. to hold them steady, and then he had several cameras clamped to this pole, and then remote shutter releases. So he would stand aside while the dragster would actually make a pass underneath this contraption, and. Um, you know, back then, fingers crossed, right? You didn't know what you had in your, on your roll of film until you took it to the dark room. No, it looked as though you wanted to say something. No, I'm just looking out here and just thinking how cool that everybody's in this room. <laughs> All right. I was, when, when, when Ken brought this together and I saw the list of um, seminar topics and I'm thinking, Do they, does anybody really want to hear about this? <laughs> and so my wife is here in the front row. She got here early and thought maybe we'd be talking to Rayleigh. Anyways, I just love just seeing so much interest and it just warms my heart, you know, for all of us because we've, yeah, we've yeah. dedicated, some of us have dedicated our entire lives to, <laughs> you know, to, to doing what I find is a bit of a hobby, but very exciting. I think there were people, uh, and uh, Alex could weigh on this too, there were some people who had the art of getting their cars on the cover. One of them I'm thinking is uh, on covers of magazines, I'm thinking of George Barris. And George was a talented photographer as well, uh, and he photographed nearly everything, uh, everything he did. But uh, he, he had a way of not just doing articles that helped promote his business, but making sure that the right shot was on, on the cover. I don't, uh, Jim? Yeah, I was going to say, Bill Burke was another one, because he was uh, yeah. ad manager of Hot Rod, and he had all these connections, and he had a bunch of cars on the cover of Hot Rod, and they're all really cool. Yeah, Bill, all the cool cars were on it. I think the best cars really have been on the cover, because I mean, that's what you want to pick of the significant cars. So that's probably what appeals to all of us. I, it's, I did not know the story about Cadzilla. <laughs> and I think that is, because that's arguably, the, you know, maybe the Hero Hata, but in my, in my, if somebody said, what's the coolest custom ever? It's Cadzilla. Yeah. And who's the coolest dude ever? It's Billy Gibbons. Billy Gibbons <laughs> and yeah. Pete Shapouris and some of those guys yeah. that really, really got it. Yeah. And you know, going back to what you had asked in the beginning about uh, why Hot Rod was, why it became popular, why it happened so quickly, um, don't forget that there were so many shops in California and there were so many varieties of shops. I mean, indie cars were being built in Southern California. There were a number of shops and there were manufacturers in California, partially due to the aircraft industry during World War II. And so it was an offshoot of that. And we had drag strips, and we had all year activity. Uh, we had stuff going on uh, at Long Beach at the harbor. Um, just it, it just goes on. You know, there was circle track, there was dirt track, so there was so much stuff to pull from, and you could pull from it all year round. So I think that was a lot of it too. Is that you know the subject matter was all there. I don't know if it would have worked if it had been in New Jersey or someplace like that, where half the year the, the weather isn't so good. So I think that was another thing. Yeah. I mean, California arguably has its problems right now. <laughs> One of the oh, things yeah. isn't weather and lifestyle, and I mean, everybody wanted to be in California. But I have a question for Ken. Why, you know, there's a Southern, there's a Southern California high boy, and there's an East Coast low boy. Why are the, are the kind of channeled cars more on the East Coast. When you see a car, you can almost say, well, that's more of an East Coast car. I've got a theory. If Tom has a theory, and I'll, I'll answer it after he does, because Tom drove a channeled car across the country. Yeah. In the winter. 
Yeah. Um, I think it's because the, the floor's rusted out in them. That's why I think. But also because they're. I mean, it you, looks cool. It looks cool. It, 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 I think they were more influenced by sports cars. And here, I think it was more just to get something done quick and take it out on the lakes. So it was easier just to take a 32 or even take a Model A body and put it on a 32 frame as opposed to going through the extra effort of channeling it. Whereas back there, they didn't have floors in them, so they could do whatever they wanted. Now, what do well, you say? Uh, before Jim answers, I, I will say that uh, I grew up in north of Boston. Yeah. I was in a hot rod club when I was 17. My parents thought I was in a study group at the library on Mondays <laughs> until my father went to the library one night looking for me and said to, said to Mrs. Forbes, um, I'm looking for Kenny. And she said, why, why tonight? Why here? Why now? And she said, my dad said, well, he comes here every Monday for the study group. He said, they don't have a study group here. <laughs> you better look for him somewhere else. But the, my friends, uh, there were a lot of channeled cars. And uh, part of it was that two guys with a, with a torch over a weekend could channel a car and get a nice low silhouette. They were, uh, you could drag race them, and it didn't mess you around too much with classes. Whereas on the West Coast, uh, modifications like that kept putting cars in a tougher, uh, tougher class. So that, that was certainly part of it. And our hero in the Boston area was Fred Steele, whose car was, uh, has been here before. And Fred had a chopped and channeled car that was only about 40 inches high. I mean, it was just, just incredible. And uh, he also owned and had some, some permission somewhere to own a machine gun. We thought that was amazingly cool at the time. But, uh, nevertheless, uh, channeled cars, I got religion when we built my, uh, my Roadster a number of years later and, and felt that, you know, a high boy is a better looking car with a chop top, so that's, that's, what we're, uh, that's what we're done. Jim, you had an answer yeah, to that too, and then we'll, and we'll have some questions. Yeah, studying the laws back east, you have to have fenders they required you to go in that's true. and certify the cars once a year, measure the headlights and stuff. In California, like, they had the fender laws, but you know you could break those and get away with them. But they wanted to go faster there. They worked all winter doing it. Then they come out taking the shows and just cruise. So the whole lifestyle was a little bit different. It kind of dictated how the cars evolved. You know, in, in February 1958, and then we'll turn this over for questions, but I'd, I'd like to say this one thing. The, uh, the cover of Hot Rod was Norm Wallace's channeled 32 Ford uh, from New Hampshire. and. Uh, the whole point and one of the cover blurbs was hot rodding in New England and there were a number of cars on the East Coast and the opening paragraphs, we all glommed onto that right away, you know, gee, thinking that the streets are paved with gold and hot rods in California, they're actually throwing some accolades at us and the, the opening line was something like they they've saw more hot rods uh, on the streets in the Boston area than they, than they did in LA on the streets and we all thought, you know, I don't believe this magazine one bit. We had our vision of California, and nobody was going to take it away from us. So, uh, we'd be glad to answer some questions, and you can ask Alex a, a question, too, if you'd like. For you guys, long history. Appreciate you guys being here. And yes, we are very interested in this forum here today. <laughs> uh, you're how, under 60 years old. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully that's Generation A IG is talking about, right? However, you guys growing up, there had to be one car that you, whether you first owned or really set you on fire for a car. Like mine was like a Ravel model of the Tarantula Dragster. Got me started on it and then I had a relative that got a 74 Targa. I took a ride for and I was like eight years old and I'll never forget that. So was there one particular car each one of you that kind of like really set you on fire? Who wants to start? Well I can start the Stu Hilborn car but I have like a family connection with that. And to me, just looking at it, it looked like it was going 100 miles an hour sitting still. And seeing it as a kid and t pushing it around and stuff like that, that's always been my favorite car. Well, for me, it was uh, Mel Toromino's 1934 Phaeton. That, but see, I came a little later than these two. Ooh. So uh, that was kind of in the late 60s and the beginning of when street rods, which I hate the term, but that's when they were starting to come up. And so Mel had this beautiful 34 fit, and that, that's, that car really got to me. My favorite car was the Pearson Brothers Coupe because it was just, you know, for me, if it's not radically chopped, it's not a hot rod. So I, I love <laughs> chopped cars, and that car just, just did it for me and kind of was lit the fire for me early. But 
my family were so opposed to wasting my time with cars. So <laughs> yeah, if I'd have had anything, any Ford, you know, 32, I'd have been happy. But you know, so that was my, you know, I, I, I guess the high boy would be, you know, like the dream car, and that's what I got back into. Um, the bullet Mustang. <laughs> I was an impressionable young kid. Watched that movie. I have to tell you. It came out in 68. I was born in 57, so you guys can do the math. As, as I went to the theater, the one thing my mother said to me about that movie was, now you know there's a man and a woman sleeping together, and they're not married, and that's not OK. <laughs> <laughs> nothing about the shotgunning, nothing about, you know, no, that was what mom wanted me to take away from that. <laughs> so I, I'm going to say something about, the, about Stuart Hilborn's Lakester, because back in that era, as uh, Tom mentioned, Bob Peterson was shooting a lot of the photography. He was trained as a photographer, and uh, to save money, that's what they did. And we, had, we would have lunch once a month when I was the director of the Peterson. <clears throat> and what, not, uh, not just once, but several times, he would bring magazines in, and we'd, we'd talk about it. And one day, he brought in the, uh, the, the cover that has the, the Hillborn Lakester on it. And we chatted a bit about it, and he said, you know, I took that picture. That's Stuart's mother's little garage, and, and that, that was his car. And he said, where is that car now? And I said, you know, it disappeared somewhere in Kansas. The, the, the first intake manifold that had it uh, survives, but the car is gone. He said, well, we ought to find it. And I said, well, Pete, Bruce Meyer has been putting out ads looking for it. And he said, you better find it before he does. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell a cute story. So we, we, we unveiled the Pearson Brothers Coupe in my garage. And we just have a classic picture. There are 30, 30 legends of hot rodding in that picture. Unfortunately, there's only 10 left. But Ken came. And Ken has been an enthusiast and a real hot rodder his whole life. And he brought the hot rod magazine with the cover of the Pearson Brothers on it. And he brought it to get signed by the Pearson brothers and by Pete Peterson. So we're kind of putting the photo together. And Ken just like carefully hands over the magazine to Pete. And just as like we're kind of putting the photo together, and Pete just takes that magazine and winds it up into like a cigar. <laughs> and I mean, the look on Ken's face, like he's, he's saved this magazine. It was like the holy grail. And I just can remember the look on your face as Pete just said, for him it was just like an old magazine or something. So he's just sitting there winding that thing so tight. And I remember Ken just like, oh my God, give me that magazine back before he ruins we flattened it. flattened it out and he signed it as well as, well as, uh, as, well as the, uh, the Pearsons. So another, another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was interested when, when Detroit connected with this whole thing and how that happened and were there some key things that you guys saw who were in the when industry. When Detroit got involved in hot rodding? Yeah, it just kind of when the magazine started paying attention to Detroit and vice versa. How'd that all work? Oh, man. Because I know GM was shuffling V8s and Oldsmobiles, and a lot of the manufacturers were coming out here, like the Winfield Cam, that ended up in the Chevrolet, and there's a lot of backdoor stuff. Because the hot rodders, they had no rules. They knew how to hop up motors. But they also would dyno them and test them and do some of that stuff. So I'm saying in the early, mid-50s, and I found some stuff when Cunningham was doing the Le Mans cars with the cans, there was some backdoor Cadillac stuff working on carburation and stuff. So they were kind of watching it all along. Well, Hot Rod actually road tested cars in the uh, 50s and, and 60s and, and beyond. I mean, it, it was yeah. good business. An ad from, uh, from Chevrolet or, or Ford probably paid a little more than an ad from the SoCal Speed Shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, um, if, you, if you look at the magazines, uh, Ray Brock started to do a lot of road tests in the, in the early to mid 50s, um, and that helped bring a lot of ad dollars. And then don't forget the uh, NHRA Nationals run in Detroit in 1959 and 1960. And, and that was a real cross-pollinization between the manufacturers being able to look at these hot rods on their home turf, you know, getting ideas about what they could do. I, I don't know that it was coincidence that the muscle car era really took root you know, in the years after that. Ford Motor Company had a, um, a show at their rotunda, and they invited 
Gene Winfield and George Barris. You go back in the old magazines and you'll see this effort. No, I was just thinking, you know, um, Detroit, it's all about marketing. And they're watching what's happening and they're seeing this performance enhancing, you know, going on out in California. It's like Harley Davidson forever. They would just turn out bikes that had no no style, and then, and then Willie decided, you know, why should we let them do all the styling? We can do it ourselves. So they started enhancing. Just like Porsche these days, you know, kind of watch the Rod Emery's and all the outlaw guys, and they're thinking, we can do that as well as anybody. So I'm sure they're sitting back in Detroit, and they're thinking, why aren't, you know, what can we do as a company to market and make our cars more appealing? So that, you know, you got the GTO and the GT350s, and again, it's, the GT350 is a bunch of hot rodders. So, they're watching, and they're watching today, too. I remember when they came out with the Prowler. I mean, they, some of the things were kind of a miss, you know? They didn't quite get it, but, um, you know, they're watching. Yeah, I think Detroit's had their eye on hot rodding for a long time. I don't know why it happened, but, like, the big block Chevy, the 396 Chevy engine, well, Blair Speed Shop in Pasadena was supposedly the first place that yeah. got it, and that engine ended up in Steve Bovan's Chevy mm -hmm. 2, uh, it was like an early form of a funny car. And uh, so, again, I don't know how that happened, but they were the first because there were, there were actually representatives from Chevy that were going over to Blair's to look at this engine because they had never seen it before. Yeah. I was going to say, you missed on Art Center College of Design, and there was so much talent that went there and went to Detroit. And it's like there's that crossover because the car guys here were hands-on. And so they knew how to hop it up and they knew, oh, we got to cut out the fender well, do all this stuff. And it was like just a real synergy. I think that's a really good answer. And we have uh -oh. in the room a Stuart Reed somewhere in here, right? <laughs> From Art Center School. And I had, what, if I had to say that, I certainly was not influenced by my family, but I grew up literally 50 feet from the Art Center School. And, the, and our grammar school playground backed up to the driveway of the Art Center School when it was on, yeah. third, on third Street. And I think you're absolutely right. These guys came in with customized cars, lowered cars, artistically done cars, and then they went back to Detroit to design the cars. I think that's, that's a really, Should really I good. Bob Ger Pete Brock. Yeah, Peter Brock. The yeah. Split window Chuck back. Pelley. Yep. Yeah, the guy named Larry Nicklin. All of those guys that went in, and then they did the custom model car. It's like there was all those little small groups. Steve Swager, yep. it's an excellent guy. It's the right place, really, right time. Probably. Larry Nicklin in the early '50s got in with his chopped and channeled '40 Ford coupe, and then when he went to GM, which I think was in '51, he left the car in his mother's garage and some extra was uh, walking by his mom's garage one day and saw it and asked if it was for sale. Well, anyway, that car ended up in the chicken scene in Rebel Without a Cause. If you look, it's, a, it's like a tomato soup colored, chopped and channeled uh, 40 Ford Coupe. Well, that was Larry's entree into getting into Art Center. So there's want, an example. I wonder if, if Stu Reed might have a comment, like how many of your designers kind of are influenced by California or come from California, because I know a lot of the big car companies have California design centers. So, you know, um, and hot rodding, we all know, came from design. right here. Can you hear me? I, no, I would say, Bruce, you know, car guys are car guys, right? So you'll talk to guys in Detroit, and they have hot rods and customs of all kinds, but they all, always will have something else, too, or many of them might be an Alfa Romeo or who knows what, you know? So, like in your garage, it's not all hot rods, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. As, as important yeah. as they are. So I think, you know, when it comes to innovation and performance and all those things, all of us just love this stuff. And, and I, I would say most designers, and I'd like to have, you know, Tom kind of chime in on this, but we're kind of automotive ADD in some ways. We love everything, you know? we love. Italian cars and historic American cars, and we love concept cars. <laughs> we love them all, right? Vintage trucks, you name it. So it's pretty hard to, you know, when, when a designer goes, you know, in a judging environment to go with a particular class mark because we love them all. You know, we're, 
kind of added color to talk about design, right? We're not maybe deeply knowledgeable about one mark. So it's all wonderful stuff. So what are you doing at Art Center these days? <laughs> what is your title? Well, my uh, privilege is to chair the Transportation Design Department Thank at you. Art Center. You know, and, and like so many of us, you know, there are Art Center people sitting right here with me. I meet two right here. But, you know, I knew I was going to Art Center when I was 16, you know, growing up in northern Michigan, you know. So <laughs> for me, you know, it was entering a General Motors design competition and winning from the state of Michigan and going to the finals and meeting Chuck Jordan and Bill Mitchell and all those guys and life-changing right there. So. Now, when I graduated from Art Center in the mid-70s, Harry Bradley was teaching. He'd been one of my teachers, loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I showed him my, por my graduating portfolio, he said, take the hot rods out. Those guys from Detroit don't want to see that. Yeah, so it that's was changed. persona non grata back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I remember sitting so many times with Tom Gale when he was planning the car he built, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, he told me he was taking welding classes and he was bragging that the frame he was designing had not a straight line on it. It was like a brush stroke <laughs> from one yeah. end to the other, you know, beautiful thing. Yeah. So this is maybe that fusion of, of you know, cross-pollinating things in car design. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued and maybe I'd question back to you guys and I'll turn it back. The connections between hot rods and sports cars. I mean... You know, some of the cars that were in Europe that were sort of hot-rodded, I mean, we were just out at the track watching Allard's battling with Curtis's. Well, there's a whole eclipse of American race car builders. What's a Curtis? Is it a sports car or a hot rod? Well, maybe a little of each, and the Allard is too, right? So. Well, we, we had a class uh, here at Pebble a few years ago called the Hot Rods that Race the, the Sports Cars. And... Uh, that was a lot of that happened because people couldn't afford to buy a new Jaguar, but they could take a, a Ford chassis and a hopped up Mercury and, and uh, lower it and yeah. put cycle fenders on it and have a competitive car. And mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they certainly did. So, so back, back to you guys, I'm interested in what were some of the first hot rods that had, you know, track noses and, and may have pushed over into road racing territory a well, little bit. What, what you're going to need to do is come out on Sunday <laughs> yeah. because you're going to see a car most of us have never seen before with a, uh, with a track nose done by Emil Diet and Luigi Lasovsky. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a channeled 32 Ford, but it really doesn't resemble a 32 Ford anymore. And uh, it, has, it has a track nose, the same type of thing that Whitey Clayton did, that Frank Curtis did. Um, but this is a car with... Uh, with a flathead and, and the blower is located behind the engine with shaft drive and gears. I mean, it's out of sight. I think people will enjoy seeing it. The first 200 people who run up to Katie when this is over are going to get a printout that uh, Jim Miller did that's got all the hot rod covers. But anybody over 65 ought to watch it because they're all like in two point type. It's just, <laughs> but I, I'm just giving you fair, fair warning. Do you have another question or two? Bill Warner asking. had nitrile methane cars this year and fired them off at noon on nitrile methane. It went over pretty good at Amelia Island. I was wondering, any chance of Pebble Beach doing that? Well, Pebble Beach has already done that. Um, a number of years ago when we had competition coupes, we had, uh, we had Art Chrisman here with his Model A, his channeled and chopped yeah. Model A, and he ran on a, on a nitro mix. Uh, he really didn't want to come up at all, and um, Bruce is one of several people who tried to convince Chris Joe McPherson that we needed that car because we had the Pearson Brothers Coupe coming, we had the SoCal Coupe, we had to have the Chrisman Coupe, and Art, uh, finally Art came around and he said, you know, I'm going to have to wear like a coat and tie, right, if I come up there? And I said, not necessarily, Art, you know, but we, we do need you to be there uh, with the car at a certain time at the, at the trailer park. Uh, where all the trailers are, and he says, all right, Mike and I will be there. We've got our rig, and uh, he said, I don't know what the fuss is here. I don't know why everybody's been calling me. I've got to bring this car. It's just a bunch of snooty people at Pebble Beach, and uh, he said, I'm just going to wear a T-shirt, and I said, fine, that'll be fine, but, but you need to be here at such and such a time, and he said, well, you need to be here waiting for me, so I was standing at the edge of the um, Polo Grounds parking lot, reliable trucks, you know, 20 or 30 of those, and passport trucks going in this direction, Art pulled up and he got out and he looked around at all the tractor trailers and he said, this is a big deal, isn't it? 
And I said, yes, yes it is, and we're glad you're here. He says, well, you know, the only way to run this motor is uh, I'm gonna have at least about a 15, 20% nitro mix. He said, so I, I, I've looked at some pictures of Pebble Beach. You got all those pretty ladies holding bouquets. That's all gonna melt. And I said, do, do what you have to do. And he did. He vaulted into the, into, that, into the coupe. And if you've ever seen that car, you know that his head is right up against the windshield. He drove it over, over the ramp. And um, then he was annoyed, now that he was into it, that uh, the car didn't win. But uh, he says, those guys wrote checks. I built this car. Well, that's uh, another story. But yeah, we've had, we've had nitro here. And maybe someday we'll have dragsters. Uh, I mean, the trick is to figure out how to get them, um, get them over the ramp. When we had streamliners a few years ago, Mark Brinker, uh, at a cost of quite a bit of money, drove the, um, the Chet Herbert streamliner over the ramp. I mean, the thing is Bonneville height, it's pretty low. And um, the Eddie Miller uh, streamliner. It drug on the ground. It, it, just could not, it. it could not do it. So um, fortunately, Don Ferguson we're standing there thinking, you gotta go over the ramp to get your trophy, right? But you can't clear the ramp with that car. And we realized that if we went through part of the flower bed right in front, he could drive the car and we could give him the trophy. And he did and we did. So we brought Alex's belly tank. And I remember when there, you know, Ken is also annoying and persuasive. So he called me and says, Bruce, you gotta bring the belly tank. And I said, you know, Ken, I mean, we, to get this thing running, it's got a hand clutch and so forth. Anyways, to make a long story short, I said, the best way to do this is if it's pushed over the ramp by the SoCal Speed Shop, like, 53 Ford pickup truck. And, of course, the powers of Power Beach says no trucks. Like, in our cover car thing, they wouldn't allow a la carte because it was a pickup truck. So there's no pickup trucks on the, on the lawn. Well, to make a long story short, we had a pickup truck. We had my son, Evan, sitting in this you know, this claustrophobic bubble in the, in the SoCal speed sh shop belly tank pushed over by the pickup truck. So, you know, Pebble Beach, at the end of the day, is very innovative. They'll do what it takes to get something done. And, you know, with a lot of persuasion from Ken, because Ken has come up with the most creative ideas. So, you know, that, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty progressive show when you think about it. I don't know how many years this has been going on. But it's, it's innovative every year, and it's entertaining every year. And uh, it's a lot thanks to, to Ken and his ingenuity and, and the open, now oh, very much open-minded you know, management, Sandra, and so forth. So. Well, the, the good news for Hot Rods is that, uh, as Bruce says, we are not giving up. We, there, are, there are so many facets of this whole thing that we haven't, haven't done yet. And uh, every year, led by Pete Eastwood, there's a little contingent that, that wants dragsters. And uh, of course, one of the challenges, as we just mentioned, is getting a dragster over the ramp uh, under its own power. I mean, it was one thing to have our Christmas uh, coupe whiffing uh, nitro fumes all the way up to the Mercedes-Benz platform there. But, but uh, you know, if you think of cackle fests, I mean, they don't move. They sit there and vibrate and make a lot of noise. So we're still working on how to make that happen. But one of these uh, Sundays in August, you're, you're going to see cool. it. You know, again, I think we ought to do a shout out for Jay Ward, who's sitting yeah. right here. Jay Ward is head of Cars for Pixar. I think everybody in this room has seen the movie Cars. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, he's, he's a young guy and he's that really writer. gets it. And you know? it, I remember when we, I visited Pixar and Jay was talking about when they were making cars and how, you know, that when they went around the track, it had to lean just right. You know, they can't. Yeah, everything had to be authentic. And to think, you know, Disney likes hot rods. Jay Ward is a hot rodder himself. And, um, you know, it's just cool when you see, you know, innovators and, and young people still hanging out with us geezers. Thank you. So real quick, what were your favorite hot rod movies and songs? <laughs> God. Oh. Who wants to start? Well, hey, little, well, little Deuce Coop and Hey, Little and Cobra, the obvious. Nine, the Beach Boys and The Beach that. Boys. You know, the Beach Boys are so California. Yeah. And when, I mean, just every time I hear Little Deuce Coop. Hot Rod Lincoln. And then, of course, <laughs> the, 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 the album cover of Little Deuce Coop has the Catello yeah. Coupe, which is as un -hot, I mean, the real hot riders go, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, but, you know, when you hear that, you forget about the vision of that coupe, and you just think of, how cool hot rodding Well, is. when you think about that cover, if you look at it, some of you probably know this, but take a look at it again, and you'll see that um, Chili Catalo 
is standing behind that car, but um, when it came to the album cover, the Beach Boys album, uh, he's he's not there. He's he's chopped off at the uh, at, at the head. I guess maybe to fit the fit the album cover. So <laughs> the, the the neat story about that car, real quick, is that Kurt Catalo, who's Chili's son. Um, he owns that car today. He had to buy it from a fellow who owned it for a long time and put a Chrysler in it and made it his car, changed it and so forth. And this guy whose name will not be mentioned didn't want to sell it when he heard that Kurt wanted to buy his dad's old car back. And his dad was a real hero. He moved to California and actually while he was going to business school, he worked for Barris to make extra money. And that car which was built by the Alexander brothers initially was chopped at Barris's with uh, uh, with Chile doing, uh, do, doing the work. Then he went on to become a successful stockbroker, died at an early age, and here's Kurt wanting to buy his father's car from a guy who will not sell it to him. So they did a subterfuge with Bob Larrabee, who uh, has run all the famous hot rod shows and still the Detroit Autorama. Larrabee was the, the buyer who bought the car and then immediately turned it over to Kurt to, uh, to restore you know, when, it. When you think about the, some of these famous cars that with a vision of, of, of record producers and movie people. I mean, they're not traditional cars. I mean, even in, um, in uh, American Graffiti, the Milner Coupe, I mean, I think that wouldn't make it on a cover if you were, you know what I'm saying? It's not like traditional. But you look at, and some of these cars, you know, like, you know, are, are kind of dolled up, you know, between Roth and Barris and some of these guys, I guess they go and they, they're such great promoters. They go to the record companies and the movie companies and they mm -hmm. sell these things that are, you don't see them running down the street, you know. No. Um, so one of the cars we have on Sunday, apropos of that, is the Kooky car. And yes. some of you may be old enough to remember 77 Sunset Strip. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so that, um, that, a lot of us watched that show because we just wanted to see Ed see Burns car. vault into that car and tear off with a screech of rubber. He was the car hop at the, Whatever the, the Dino's Club, the night, then, yeah, the, there. So that car was purchased by a man named Jim Skonzakis in the in the Midwest. Jim and Street. Jim Street was what he called himself because no one could pronounce Skonzakis, and uh, he he squirreled it away for a long time, uh, and he had Larry Watson repaint it. He put quad headlights on it, twin blowers, twin rear wheels. It was just a mess. Uh, and uh, it was sold at a Mecham auction for well over $480,000. Uh, Ross Myers purchased it, took it to Roy Brizio's, and you'll see it on the field along with Tommy Ivo's car. Um, I mean, recreating history here is something we like it's to do. It's just some of these cars are just almost like clown cars. They're just so overdone. And, and God love Bob Peterson. But he, you know, if, if, if it weren't for Ken and a lot of guidance, it would, they wouldn't be... There would be more Barris cars and, you know, that bullshit scraper and <laughs> some of the fire trucks. I mean, that's what he liked. And when he opened his museum up on Hollywood Boulevard, remember that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, George, George Barris and Big Daddy Roth, that whole, it was stuff that, like the real hot rodders, I would say it, it was, it's not traditional. But, you know, Pete's po whole point for that, and that's why I think he would love the way the Peterson Museum has been redesigned, he wanted things that would attract people and lots of people. I mean, he had, a, he had a showman's eye for that sort of thing, even if he wasn't a dyed-in-the-wool car guy. And, uh, and that, that, I think, is the reason. Yeah. I really do. Oh, yeah. No, he wanted the unusual, just the oddities, curiosities. <laughs> Carol Connors wrote that hot wet song, Hey Little Cobra. Right. Well, and, and you could probably say that American Graffiti, which we were talking about, helped spearhead a revival of interest in, uh, in hot rodding because, you know, the muscle cars that uh, Drew alluded to, uh, when you could buy a, uh, a 57 Chevy with a four-speed and fuel-injected motor that would blow off a 40 Ford with an Olds engine, um, you really needed... Uh, uh, it went away. Guys just garaged their cars, and uh, I don't want to end on a down note, but uh, American Graffiti reminded everybody these cars were cool. And, and I, think, I think you all agree. So yeah. let, let us, uh, Katie's giving us the, the hook here because there are other groups that have to come. So let, on behalf of everybody, thank, thank you all for your attention. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.